Hello everybody and welcome back to Guided Hacking. This is Fred HK and today we're going to be looking at the Malox ransomware. Let's get into it. So I pulled up the Malox ransomware in IDA here uh, and jumped to the main function. The binary and sample that I have doesn't seem to be obfuscated very much so we can get straight into analysis. We first see that the malware will get the user default uh, language ID and then compare it to these integers here. If I take one of these integers and then search it on a list of these language identifiers, we can see that it's checking whether the language identifier indicates that the infected system is within CIS countries. This is common for a lot of malware to do because Russians will intentionally not attack any CIS countries so that they are looked on more favorably by the law. If the check for these languages returns true, so if any of the infected systems are within these countries, then the binary will return zero and it'll exit and it won't carry out any of the commands you can see here. Next up, the malware will call the set power active scheme and will try to set this power scheme for the current user. This is just to try and stop the system from shutting down during the ransomware operations. It'll then call SE take ownership privilege and then SE debug privilege so that it can get more privileges during its malicious activity. After that, it'll call three functions here within a thread. And within these functions, we can see that it's going to be creating and deleting some Windows registry keys. We can see that it's deleting the keys of event log, and specifically Raxine, which is a ransomware prevention tool. It'll then also delete the keys of VSS admin, WMIC admin, and so on here. This is just to allow it to have more functionality over the system. It'll also copy the sys native VSS admin and the delete shadows all quiet. So it's going to delete all the all of the shadow copies after executing these with shell execute W. In the next function that the malware will call within these threads, we'll see that it will call shell execute within a wrapper and then give it this command of bcd edit, changing the boot status policy to ignore all failures, and then also disable the recovery. This is to aid in it functioning cor correctly during its locking functions. And for the system to function properly after these are completed. It will then call another function, which is another wrapper. The parameters here is to delete the Microsoft SQL launcher and then delete all kinds of other services that are going on within the system. So we can see that it's going to stop MySQL also a few other services such as SQL telemetry, SQL agent, and then it's going to go on to then call some task kills of SQL browser, SQL agent, and so on. This is all just to stop a lot of common database processes from running so that the ransomware can correctly encrypt some of the databases that are running on the system creating even more issues for the victim. After all of this, the malware is then going to import the NTDLL and get the process address of NT query object and use that to get the module file name of where the malware is currently residing. It'll then go through the file name and will go and enumerate through that string until it arrives on this backslash character here, which is escaped by another backslash. It'll then initialize some critical sections and then we'll continue on to create a shutdown block reason for the reason of do not shut down or re reboot your PC. This might damage your files permanently. This is to avoid the victim from shutting down the malware before it's done functioning. And it'll edit some of the registry keys here and put in the values of hide shutdown. And the malware will then proceed to edit some of these registry keys here of hide shutdown, hide restart, and hide sign out so that the victim can't stop the malware while it's in process. And it'll also disable shutdown without logon. And we'll edit a few other unimportant registry keys before it continues with its main functions. We're now within the main encryption function within the ransomware. Looking through it, we start with the arguments being retrieved from the process, and then it'll be compared to these flags that can be used when running ransomware. 
The first is tag L, then tag D, then tag P, and then tag Path. The tag P, tag D, and tag L, I'm unsure as to what they do, but it seems as though it will copy whatever is following this argument into a stream, and it may open them as well. The tag Path command is somewhat self-explanatory as this is probably being used for the ransomware to specifically target a given path when called. After these arguments are handled, the ransomware will then query the performance counter and use some of these tick counts to then call the crypt gen random. This way it's using this tick count to generate a random string of bytes that can be used then as a key for the encryption. The ransomware will then call get computer name A and get a few more pieces of information about the infected system. It'll then continue on to start the encryption process. And I'm not going to describe how the encryption process works because it's incredibly complex. But what it'll first do is find each file and then recursively encrypt them with whatever routine this ransomware is using. I've checked and it isn't using a standard encryption library from any of the standard libraries within Windows. So it's probably implementing its own encryption routine or it's re-implementing it instead of using libraries. We can then see that it's going to create a file called howtorecover.txt. And this file will define how a infected user can recover their files. If we look in the strings, section of the binary, we can see that this is the complete how to recover text. And what's important about this is that it will direct you towards their onion site where you can sign in with your private key. And then it'll also have the private key here, which will be replaced further on within the malware. To see where this key is replaced, we can go into this function here and I'll decompile it. And we can see that Within these comparisons here, it's looking for the ID string and then it'll put in the string here, this variable, and this variable is created through this function. It seems to be a lot of bitwise logic and I don't completely understand it, but the resulting string is a 24 hex hexadecimal looking string. After that file has been created, all of this information will then be used to send to the C2. Looking at the C2 communications, we see another call for get computer name A, and then getting some locale information, and it'll request api.ipfi.org to get the IP of the infected system, as long as, as well as getting the processor architecture and a few other pieces of information. And we can see the unobfuscated C2 URL here, and we can see that it's a PHP file. I imagine that this is just a gate for the malware to send infection information, but we saw that onion panel earlier where the user should go to try and decrypt their files. So this probably won't contain a panel anywhere or too many interesting things. Lower within the code, we can see that there is information about the user being sent, the target ID, system information, max file size, and size of hard drive. If you do purchase the decryption routine, the operator of the malware will use that to define a decryption tool for you if they do in intend on actually decrypting their victim's information on upon payment. As some ransomware operators just do a encryption routine that can't be reversed because once they have the payment, they don't actually care about the victim. These are all then sent to the C2 and we can see a file here being called targetinfo.txt and this will be some of the information about the target which may be used by the decryption routine or for the target to be able to understand some of their information for when the threat actor will communicate with them. And these are all written in with this limited information. And looking at what's written into this file, we can see that it'll be the target ID first, then the system information, the max size of file and the size of the hard drive, which are also pieces of information which are sent to the C2. After completing that function, the program will return and it'll continue with restoring the hide shutdown, hide restart and hide sign out and also restore the shutdown without log on. It'll also continue to delete critical sections and then exit with a return value of zero. I hope that was a good overview of the Malox ransomware. Thank you so much for watching and until the next one, goodbye.